Okay, welcome everyone. I was just watching the participant ticker and we just got past 100, so I guess we're good to go. So welcome back. Um, I'm Laura Telford. I'm the organic specialist for Manitoba Agriculture. And we're back with uh, Dr. Martin Enns from uh, the University of Manitoba and his fabulous organic training series. And that voice you just heard belongs to the lovely Marla Carlson, who is the coordinator of the Prairie Organic Development Fund and also the executive director for Task Organics. And she has been organizing everything in the background to make this feel seamless. Um, so now that you know everything that you need to know about managing uh, nutrients in an organic system, Martin is gonna talk today about crop establishment, seeding systems, tillage, and weed control. Um, so it's the same drill as yesterday. You'll be on mute for, for this in the next couple of sessions. And you will be posting your questions in the chat box. And I have to say you did an amazing job in terms of engagement yesterday. Um, you posted multiple comments and Martin has over 36 questions from this session to answer. So I'll be curious to see how, how he does if, if you keep up that pace each day for five or four days. So keep it up. We want Martin to earn his keep. Um, keep challenging him. He actually uh, wrote a sample answer to one of your questions and we will send it to you after the session is over. And if Martin has time, he's gonna answer a few of the questions at the end of this session. Otherwise, it's the same deal. We'll aggregate them all and he'll answer them with the PowerPoint on January 13th. So my email is up there on the screen and that's where you shoot your questions after this session as you're reading the course note. And Janet Wallace has reminded us that if you are a keener, um, that person in high school who always did your homework and you downloaded the course notes early, you should probably go back to the Pivot and Grow site. Um, which is right here and download a new copy. I don't think the content has really changed, but the formatting has, and it should be easier to understand the, the new formatting. Okay, so um, as with yesterday, uh, the recordings will be available after the course. And if you go to the site on screen, you will see not only the course notes, but yesterday's recording if you missed it. And you will also see Martin's PowerPoint. So I'm hoping the same thing will be true each day. And we will send you a link to, to let you know that, that things are posted. And for those of you who are professional agronomists, again, wait to the very last slide and you will be able to point your camera at the QR code on the screen and that should bring up a link that you just click on and then you could go in to enter your registration information so that you can get one full CEU credit uh, for each of these courses. And my understanding is that each course has a, a credit in a different category. So as uh, with all of these trainings. Um, it is brought to you by the Prairie Organic Development Fund, which is um, basically an investment platform to fund organic associations in the Prairie region and innovative projects that are Penn Prairie in scope. Um, so Martin mentioned briefly yesterday that one of the projects that PODF is working on is uh, an app. So Martin has developed a spreadsheet for um, budgeting nutrients across a crop rotation. And this was in an Excel spreadsheet format. And it takes a lot of that math that he talked about yesterday. And uh, behind the scenes, there's calculations to figure out uh, how much nitrogen a particular crop is producing. 
So the Prairie Organic Development Fund has taken that spreadsheet and is in the process of turning it into a simple app that farmers can use to figure out what nutrients are available um, with green manures as well as figuring out how many nutrients are removed by each crop that you grow. So I think that's going to be a valuable tool. Um, our funders, we couldn't do this without the Canadian government through the Canadian Agricultural Partnership and um, the matching uh, funders who are Grain Millers, Sasquatch Development Commission, Nature's Path, the Bauda Family Initiative on Canadian Seed Security, PHS Organics, and FW Cobbs. Thank you very much all for that. So on to Martin, I'm not gonna read his bio this time, um, just to say thank you to the University of Manitoba and to Martin Enns for being so generous with your time. Um, and we really appreciate the fact that you are so, sharing and, and and want that information to get out there. So thank you, Martin, and I'm going to hand it off to you. Okay, thank you very much, Laura. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I just want a confirmation that you can hear me and see the slides on the screen. Somebody could let me know that. Yeah, yeah. if you just want to put it in presentation mode. Yeah. Okay, there it is. It's in presentation mode. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I've been enjoying the questions that have come in, and um, I, I don't want to make it too formal next Friday. But uh, you know, I'm I'm going to just focus on delivering the material, and uh, but I am reading the questions and I've started answering them, and I'm going to try to uh, get to a couple of them at the end of the session today. So wherever you are, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Um, I uh, I'm so happy that you're back. And uh, I'm happy to be back. So today, I want to do two things. Um, talk first of all about seeding and seeding systems, and then talk about tillage and some weed management. So here is a list of topics that uh, I want to touch on today in terms of getting those organic crops off to a good start. And one of the first questions is, you know, variety selection or cultivar selection. And um, I think most farmers uh, access uh, provincial or state uh, information on the performance of varieties and um, look for things like what is the market class, what is the yield and the quality, days to maturity, height, disease, resistance, uh, and this is really important in organics. Remember yesterday I talked about that 18 bushel uh, oat crop was when we had a crown rust susceptible oat variety. And so disease resistance is really uh, critical because you know there are no, not the type of fungicides that exist in chemical agriculture. And so, and the diseases that is particularly uh, uh, important is the seed borne diseases. Because if you get smut and bunt in your seed and you use that seed over and over again, uh, you're gonna build up that population in your, in your crop and you need to go to a clean seed source. But you can also make the decision to grow um, varieties that have resistance to, for example, uh, oat smut. And that's what's shown in this slide. So looking at these charts and studying them is really important. One other uh, item that I found on the Alberta Agriculture uh, Variety um, page is they listed sprouting resistance. And this might be a little bit more relevant to organic production because we often swath our crops, not always, uh, but if they're weedy, swathing helps dry down the weeds. And once you've got a crop in a swath, then there's of, of inclement weather um, coming in. And, uh, and if the variety is not resistant to sprouting, uh, you can't. And if it lays on the swath for a long time, that's a problem. And there are uh, sprouting resistant uh, varieties. 
up till now, I think a lot of organic farmers have been making their variety choices based on exactly the charts that I showed you that come from conventional agriculture. But more and more, we're seeing varieties being tested under organic production. And this is the information which is also of, you know, very relevant to organic farmers. So I want to share a little bit about the work that we've done to test um, just ordinary varieties and some novel varieties under organic production. And we've been doing this for over 10 years and have quite a large data set built up. Um, so this is the variety that many people will be familiar with in Canada, in Western Canada, I should say, uh, AAC Brandon. Um, it is, a, you know, has been a very good variety. Uh, it's very popular. It's an Ag Canada variety. It's got, it's short, as you can see in this, um, in this experiment. Um, the other uh, variety I'm drawing your attention to is AAC Tradition. This is um, also an Agriculture Canada variety, but uh, it was selected under organic management by the scientists. And so we collaborated with them and put the early generation nurseries on organic land. So this is a little bit of a departure from traditional plant breeding. Um, and it's exciting. Uh, it's registered now. And then this third line I'm showing you is actually uh, a, um, a, I'm going to call it a variety or land race, which was selected under organic conditions as well. But this time it was selected by farmers. And so we've been working with farmers across Canada in a, in a participatory plant breeding program to try to, to see if we could uh, if farmers selecting on their farms would actually uh, produce better varieties for organic production. And we've been making progress a little bit more on that later. <clears throat> oats here is a, a very popular new, uh, very good oat, uh, CDC Dancer. This is what it looks like under organic production. And and one of the, th the things about growing these uh, varieties tests under organic is there's just more weeds and it's a more realistic situation. Um, uh, to what farmers are actually facing. Um, next to CDC Dancer, we've got Summit, which is, uh, I believe it's an Ag Canada variety. I it, it designated it as such. It's very popular. It's shorter. Um, and, uh, and then again, we have a farmer selected line. This comes from Northern Alberta. And I'm really excited to say that this line is in its final stages to get registered as an official variety by Agriculture Canada out of Brandon, Manitoba. So we'll see if it makes it, but it's been in three years of co-op testing. Um, and you can see it's taller. Uh, there are no weeds there. And so I guess my conclusion is that in the future, uh, we'll, we will see more varieties uh, available that might just be a bit better suited for organic farmers. So my PhD student, Michelle Karkner, has been doing some of these uh, this testing. And how did the varieties do? Well, if we look at our sad, low-yielding sites uh, where we had a lot of stress, we had seven site years, and we're doing these right across the prairies, uh, we can see that AAC tradition, this Ag Canada line that was selected under organic production, did the best. And Brandon didn't do very well. Um, Vesper is a midge tolerant variety, which has always performed well under organic for us. I think it speaks to the value of midge tolerance. And these two varieties here, they're actually from the University of Alberta. They're designed for very short seasons. So this is a little unfair to have them in here. And then under really good yielding conditions, you can see that um, you know Brandon did well. It is a very, very good variety. Um, and yeah, Vesper yielded, uh, yielded the best. So what is this telling us? I think it's telling us that under stressful conditions, some of these features that are baked, baked into the organic varieties might actually be useful. And when conditions are really good, it's just not that important. And good condition usually means precipitation and not too many weeds. We also did this work with barley, and um, here we have an 18 bushel per acre difference between the lowest yielding and the highest yielding uh, barley variety. 
And so this just goes to show me that it's important that we, we test our varieties under realistic organic conditions. And, and the dockage also is much lower with this higher yielding variety than the low yielding variety. More recently, um, people have been, plant breeders have been interested in selecting varieties that work in intercropping situations. And so I'm just sharing a little bit of data from uh, Heather Flood's work, where we looked at uh, AC Morgan, which is a very popular organic oat variety. It's tall, it's high yielding, as you can see, dancer. Uh, this is the uh, FB Alberta line that we hope will be a variety, and this is Kongsor. Um, which uh, is a new uh, variety developed under organic production. And I'm just showing you this to, to indicate that when we mix these varieties, for example, with peas, which is in the orange line, um, you know, that reduces the yield of the oats, but of course we get some pea yield out of it. And then we also mixed it with vetch, uh, hairy vetch, which we would assume would be a late season cover crop. And, uh, we can see that Morgan actually maintained its yield better than Kongsor when it had that cover crop grown with it, but there was no difference between Morgan and Dancer and FB Alberta. So, so these are, you know, this is a little bit, um, you know, it's a very small data set, but just to get us thinking about variety selection if we're going to do intercropping. And there's so much that can be said about varieties. You know, I've got the hallway here in, in my office areas full of plant breeders and they love to talk about varieties and and so and you know it is an important thing, but there's so much more. Let's talk about seeding rate. Uh seeding rate is probably, I would say, one of the most after you know, after having a good disease variety, it's a very critical factor. I, I regard it as really, really important. And you can see here just how much better 350 plants per meter squared looks. Um, if we go with low seeding rates, we all know what happens. Uh, the weeds just have a chance to get established and it really puts us behind the eight ball. And so low plant population densities, either through low seeding rates or poor emergence is something that we want to avoid. Uh, just again, some pictures of the work that we did here at the university, looking at Cardale wheat in this case, 150, 250, 350 plants per meter squared. Just a very, very big difference there. Um, you know, one of the questions that comes up with these high plant populations is what about drought tolerance and water use? And I remember I had the opportunity to work in Australia and high, high large plants uh, use a lot of water and, you know, the question is, did that get the plant in trouble later in the season? And a crop like wheat is, its yield is very much determined on what happens up to flowering. And so I, I think for most temperate growing regions like ours, high populations are in the end a good thing. Just a little bit of, of data from our work um, looking at uh, plant population density, and I am going by plants per meter squared, not by bushels per acre because seed size varies. So you can see we go from 150 to two, 350. There's a 12 bushel per acre increase of wheat across all these varieties. And then on the right-hand side here, we can see that as we increase our seeding rates, our dockage goes down. And, you know, when I show this to my, you know, Chem conventional crop students, they go, that dockage is really high. And well, that's sometimes the case in organic agriculture. The dockage can be high, but it can be reduced by increasing the seeding rate. And again, there is a varietal difference here. It's interesting that tradition has the lowest dockage. And Waskata, which is a taller wheat, uh, really responds to uh, high seeding rates when you uh, um, look at the dockage. What about peas? So uh, the group led by Dr. Steve Shirtliff at the University of Saskatchewan looked at uh, plant populations for organic peas. And you know they looked at about 150 
uh, seeds per meter squared, viable seeds being sort of an optimum seeding rate for, for um, uh, the economic return. Uh, you know, seed is expensive uh, and organic seed is more expensive. Uh, so even though grain yield kept, kept going up with more seeds, um, the economic yield was um, at a, about 150. So the trade-off there is weed control, right? Um, and that's something that people need to balance for themselves. And you may have questions about that. The other uh, grain legume that there's questions about seeding rates on is soybean. And this would apply maybe not to people in the Western prairies, but in other parts of, of the listening audience, you know, soybean plant populations are uh, interesting. So in Minnesota, at the University of Minnesota, Craig Schieffer and their team there um, uh, did, a, did, did some studies and, and concluded that Minnesota organic growers who use mechanical weed control do not need to adjust cultivar selection or seeding rate according to planting date, and that uh, they did not um, observe uh, any advantage of going to a higher seeding rate uh, as long as they had 120,000 plants per acre. So, um, you know, this is not the only data set around, but it is one of those data sets that was done under organic production. And then let's turn to seeding depth. So, you know, I'm giving you agronomy 101 here and you're probably going, this is not that exciting, but hey, it, you know, we're gonna end with a bang today. <laughs> okay. Um, seeding depth, um, very, very critical. Um, seeding, deep seeding, we know reduces yield potential. And there's always a question of, do you seed into moisture? Of course you need to seed into moisture. And so um, farmers are having to juggle this all the time. They know that seeding shallow is better for yield potential, but they want to get a crop out of the ground. So uh, let's take a look at a cereal plant here and look at the uh, sort of anatomy of it. The green uh, arrows it depicts the seeding depth because you can see the seed of the wheat uh, located there. And then the yellow arrow is the location of the crown. And this contains all of the buds for future leaf development and for future root growth. It's interesting that wheat has two root systems. It has the seed roots, the seminal roots here. And then at the crown up here, you can see my cursor, that's where the adventitious or the crown roots grow from. And they're important for lodging resistance. And so we want to have that crown well enough developed so we get good crown roots. And over on the right here, when we have such small crown tissue, we're not gonna have a lot of buds in there and the plant is just not gonna have that root system. And that's gonna reduce its, its, its drought tolerance and its ability to compete with weeds. So seeding depth is, uh, is something that can reduce your yield. And the other thing that deep seeding can do is it can actually keep your plant from actually establishing. So if we look at the anatomy here of the emerging seedling, this sheath here uh, that protects the first true leaf, it's called a coleoptile. And, um, and this is what breaks through the soil. And if the crop has a very short coleoptile, or you've seeded really too deep, like we see on the right here, and the leaf emerges out of the coleoptile before it gets out to the, to the air above the soil surface, the plant likely will die, and it'll certainly be very weak if it doesn't. So, you know, who cares about this? We've been growing wheat for centuries. Well, when we uh, developed semi-dwarf varieties, we selected for shorter coleoptile. And so um, measuring the coleoptile length in, a, in like a tissue paper sort of experiment in a germination cabinet is something that we like to do just to get a sense of how our varieties um, measure up in terms of the, the longest possible coleoptile measurement. So if you look here, you've got six, eight centimeter coleoptile length, but that's not in a soil, that's in this tissue paper. And we can see that 
you know, the semi-dwarf Brandon has a little bit shorter coleoptile, and we would expe expect that. And uh, Cadillac, a taller variety, Red Fife, a very tall variety of slightly higher coleoptile. So these are Western Canadian wheats, and we've also done this for wheats that you would grow in the eastern part of our country. Um, and uh, and so some of them are are short, um, shorter coleoptile. So those crops, you have to be careful how deep you plant them. And if we look at seeding depth and yield, what we did in this experiment is we took a bunch of uh, seed from farmers, from organic farmers, and then we um, that's where the different seed sources come from. And then we we planted them at either one inch or two inches and looked at the yield. And in all cases, the yield was lower with the deeper seeding. Not always was it significantly lower. And then we looked at dockage. And here, three out of five cases, we had uh, lower, significantly lower dockage uh, at the shallow seeding. So I think this is something that most farmers know intuitively. Uh, but again, we're always you know, ha having to make that decision. Uh, do we see deeper into moisture, especially in a drought year, uh, or do we see shallow and wait for rain? Um, and, and so I've borrowed this slide from uh, an organic farmer in Manitoba uh, who's, um, you know, seeding, seeding a crop here. And I like this picture because um, the, the seed seems to be going in fairly shallow. And you can see there's a dead cover crop here. And what uh, we've experienced many times is if you have something like oats that you seed in the fall and it just, it doesn't grow huge, but it, it just provides this little mulch in the springtime. And then you get in there really early and direct seed. Uh, you can have some really terrific crop stands uh, for early seeded crops like wheat and peas and things, uh, oats, things that like to be in the ground early or can tolerate being in the ground early. So seeding shallow into moisture is more than just setting the machine. It's also, you know, try, you know, looking at maybe direct seeding and putting a mulch on the surface. Um, seed size, uh, something that, um, uh, you know, we don't always think about. We we get a bag of seed and and comes from us. You know, we make sure the weeds are out of it, but. Um, what kind of role can larger seed play in making more vigorous seedlings? And that would be good in organic production. Uh, or could larger seeds allow you to plant deeper and not uh, sacrifice the crown tissue, for example? So here uh, we've just taken a, a wheat sample and we've sieved it using the standard industry sieves, like a you know a five and a half sixty fourths by three quarter inch slotted sieve. I think most people know what these look like. And, and you can see that by the, the thousand kernel weight there, um, that the, the seed mass or the seed weight is massively different. So even if we use a six sieve, we've got 30 grams per thousand seeds. If we use a five sieve, it's quite a bit lower. You know, it's, it's more than or lower. So, um, so does it matter? Well, in the work that Catherine Stanley and I did, we again took farmer seed lots and we sieved them. Um, you know, you can read the paper if you want the exact sieve sizes because it, it varied a bit depending on the original plumpness that, the, that came off the field. But if we look at wheat uh, going to larger seed always resulted in uh, statistically significant yield increases and always resulted in less dockage. Um, so the conclusion for wheat anyways, was that large seed made a difference. Here are some pictures, uh, small seed, medium seed, large seed um, planted at one inch depth. And, you know, we can see better, better uh, ground cover here. Let's do it at two inches of depth. Here it is. And, um, you know, the results might be a little bit more striking not the most professional photography in terms of we think we're at the same height but and then if we actually compare the combination of deep seeding and small seed with shallow seeding and large seed the gold star goes to this treatment over here 
the combination of shallow seeding and larger seed really um, makes that plant so much more competitive compared to over here where there's a lot of open spaces. And two and a half inch seeding is not excessively deep. Um, and this is really what we were trying to do in our research is find out whether we could overcome deep seeding if we used larger seed. And I, what we found is that they were both important, seeding depth and seed size. Uh, we also looked at seed size with oats. Um, the uh, yield response was pretty consistent, as was the reduction in dockage. <clears throat> and so the uh, um, maybe not quite as dramatic as with wheat. And so the the conclusion that we made, and here here is the paper. it's it's on open access if you ever want to read it. But what we noticed in all of this work, I've underlined, you know, one of the interesting conclusions for me was that averaged across years and across barley and oat crops, which is the ones that we worked with mainly, our results show that for each, you know, one kilogram per hectare invested in seed, we got 10 kilograms per hectare of grain back. So, you know, a 10 to one return on investment. So one pound per acre of uh, seed gives us 10 pounds per acre of grain. Okay, so that's what we observed. And then the question becomes, how is, what is the best way to, to invest in that extra, you know, kilogram per hectare of seed? Should we increase seeding rates or should we increase seed size or should we do a combination? And our, our results, um, we didn't look at the combination. So I can't answer that question, but I would say they're both important. For most farmers though, I think increasing the seeding rate is probably the easiest to do. Um, and, uh, uh, and then of the thing that I haven't talked about is seed vigor and germination percentage. And these things are all really important. <clears throat> and maybe the final thing I should add on the seed size is is that there are seed labs everywhere that can test your grain for things like smut and other seed-borne diseases. And that's a good investment uh, in organic production because there's few tools to deal with those. So I've talked mostly about grains. Um, I also just wanted to draw our attention to seeding systems for forages and cover crops. And there's many ways of seeding forages, of course. They can be seeded with an air seeder, with a grain drill, uh, with, um, or they can be broadcast and harrowed. Uh, you know, it's more efficient. Sometimes the establishment may not be quite as good. Um, we always want to inoculate our legumes uh, so that we have good nitrogen fixation and, you know, use um, high quality seed and the seeding rates. Um, that's a good question. I think when we're looking at small seeded uh, clovers and alfalfa, we're usually looking at, you know, eight to 15 pounds per acre of seed in, in most of Canada. So that's what I wanted to say about seeds. And um, uh, that was the first part of today's lecture. And I think we're making pretty good time. So uh, let's take a stretch. Let's just take a deep breath. Um, maybe that's mostly for me because I'm busy yakking here. And sometimes, you know, you just get hunched over when you're talking. And um, maybe while we're on our break, I'll also wish, um, wish all of the people of Ukrainian heritage um, um, a Merry Christmas. Uh, today is uh, Orthodox Christmas Eve, I believe. Um, and, uh, you know, I also take this opportunity to, again, to thank you for participating and to wish you uh, a, a great weekend. I mean, we have 173 people on here. We come from so many different places. Our life circumstances are all different. And, um, but it's, it is nice to be able to gather around this common theme of organic production. All right. Um, the second part uh, is tillage and weed control. And this is a huge topic. Um, this is an important topic. 
because tillage is part of organic agriculture. And maybe I'll just say that uh, right off the top that tillage is a form of disturbance, right? It is not unnatural. Maybe we do it excessively in unnatural ways. But, you know, when the bison were rolling across the prairie, uh, their hoofs did a lot of disturbance. And the other thing, just in defense of organic agriculture, uh, that applying herbicides and applying fungicides and applying insecticides, that's also disturbance because it, it, it also disturbs the system. So we need to uh, put this into context. But I will end off today's tillage session with three examples of conservation tillage for organic production in the eastern part of the country, in kind of the, the humid part of the prairies, and then in the dryland zones. And by the way, I, when I think about Canada, Eastern versus Western, Winnipeg is in the longitudinal center of Canada. So Eastern Canada would be everything east of here and Western Canada would be everything west of here. Okay, so when we look at tillage in a typical spring seeded crop, um, there's all kinds of opportunities to use. Uh, we can do pre-emergence tillage early in the spring. Um, and this is a tricky one because we're trying to balance this with our major flush of weeds, and we're going to come back to that. We can do pre-emergence tillage uh, after planting, before the crop is up. We can do early in-crop tillage. We can do late in-crop tillage, especially with row crops. But I remember being on an organic farm in Germany where they were harrowing out the viney vetch, which was growing in wheat. I'd never seen that before. And then we can do fall tillage and things like, you know, spikes for, uh, you know, right before freeze up is an important way to deal with Canada thistle. So there's all kinds of tillage opportunities. And um, let's talk about those. Okay, so right at the beginning of the season, uh, in a spring planted crop situation, uh, do we do pre-plant tillage? The previous picture I showed you of Scott Beaton's direct seeding uh, is, is really exciting because it shows that some organic farmers choose to direct seed in the spring of their early season, season crops. Uh, and I think that's a really good strategy. Save the soil moisture, don't disturb the weeds. Um, <clears throat> but pre-seeding tillage is a reality uh, for uh, other organic farmers. And um, the intensity of the tillage really should be uh, dictated by the weed species. If, if you have quack grass or Canada thistle, uh, you know, you've got a challenge and you might have to do some more aggressive tillage in the springtime. But most times we want to avoid aggressive tillage. We want to conserve our moisture. So things like a rod weeder, like you're looking at here, can be an option. So the question that that I ask myself every spring um, is, should seeding be done early before the flush of weeds, or should we let most of the weeds germinate and then seed once they're all germinated? You know, and that's the old philosophy, you know, let all the wild oats germinate and then seed. And it works for certain weeds, uh, like wild oats, but it doesn't work for all weeds because some weeds, in my experience, just keep flushing. And so, I, you know, it's hard to know when when to seed and when not to seed. Um, you know, one rule of thumb is to either seed at really early before all the weeds are up or once they're, once they're all emerged. And it'll be interesting to see if you have questions about this or comments. I look forward to reading those. If we look at uh, crop yield potential, we know there are certain crops for which early seeding is really important. So this is data from uh, the Manitoba Crop Insurance Corporation, and it shows uh, the potential yield from commercial farms if uh, seeding was done the first week of May, the second week of May, the third week of May, et cetera. And we can see crops, for example, this brown line here, field peas, its yield potential drops off according to commercial field farm records very quickly with later seeding. Other crops like this blue line up here, flax, it can be seeded later the third week of May in Manitoba and not really suffer a yield penalty. 
And so I think you know where I'm going with this. Some crops really you should be seeding early and some crops you could easily delay uh, and get some weed control done before seeding. And so these are all the considerations that you and the agronomists that advise you are all too familiar with. You know this stuff. Okay, before I get into some of the, maybe what you expected me to talk about in terms of tillage, let me just share with you uh, one little anomaly. Um, it's a very happy one. Um, the uh, de Varvarens uh, are farmers in Quebec and Matthew has shared some of their story with me and I will share that with you. One of the innovations is they purpose built this cultivator to terminate red clover cover crops. As you can see, the shanks are firmly mounted on the machine to promote uh, effective undercutting of the clover. And this allows them to kill their clover in one pass. And so we had talked about growing cover crops. Well, the picture in the background is from just south of Winnipeg, where we put a cover crop into um, a winter cereal. And here we are in the, uh, you know, we're gonna have to kill this cover crop next spring. And here are farmers who've actually designed a piece of equipment which can undercut and not flip too much of the soil and, and not damage the soil very much. So I think it's pretty exciting. All right, so um, this is what I thought you might expect me to talk about. Let's go back through the, the, the annual cycle, pre-emergent tillage, things like the weeding harrow here. Um, the rotary hoe on the left um, and the picture on the top, which just indicates that we have been harrowing weeds for a long, long time. Um, so pre-emergence tillage is something that we uh, that is recommended to do, you know, four or five days after seeding. And does that make any sense? Like we just, let's say we seeded with wide sweeps. We just went through the field, killed all the weeds. Why would we do this again? Well, um, the uh, timing is really based on the fact that uh, after we seed the crop and if there is moisture and if there's any kind of packing or harrowing after seeding, we're gonna stimulate a lot of small seeded weeds like mustards, red root pigweed, lamb's quarters and all of that ilk. And, and what we want to do is harrow them lightly so when they're in the white thread stage and that effectively kills them. So that's why uh, that pre-emergence tillage is viewed as important. And I would have to say, I'm showing a picture here of Keith Bamford harrowing <clears throat> our organic soybeans uh, at Carmen. Um, and um, I'm showing this picture because in the broad-leaved crop world, like soybean production, uh, I would say that we, we tend to see more of these broad-leaved weeds. So the harrowing is especially important if you've got a lot of red root pigweed and lamb's quarters and ragweed and that type of thing. Um, and and uh, it, of course, it's not going to do any damage to the wild oats. Uh, timing is important. Uh, we don't want to uh, have the soybeans, for example, in the hook stage. Uh, we want to get it before, while it's just, just below this so that we don't break it off. Here is a picture of post-emergence tillage in peas, thanks to Jason Peters. And the nice thing about peas and lentils is they're very tolerant of harrowing. They're very tolerant of disturbance. Um, and so... Um, so what I what I want to do is just summarize some of this work. Um, and this summary in this case comes from Scandinavia, where there has been more organic weeding research, certainly than in Canada. And what did they learn? Uh, well, pre-emergence harrowing increased the average cereal crop by 6.2%, post-emergent harrowing by 4%. And the combined effect was 10%. Crop yield was mainly increased on hard packed soils. And I think that's where the harrow did a better job on the weeds. Weed and crop responses varied strongly among experiments. I think any farmer harrowing would agree to that. You know, you, you never quite know what you get, but the efficacy of pre and post emergence weed harrowing was, was always positive. Weed species composition was of minor importance. 
I think that's because they didn't have wild oats. And uh, but among broadleaf weeds, I would say that that's that makes sense to me. And this study indicates that one aggressive post-emergence cultivation may be as good as pre-emergence and one less aggressive. So uh, post-emergence cultivation. So this is this is what they came up with. And I have to say, some of these weeding harrows are getting really good. Um, you know, they're better than the old ones that we have. And I'm I'm impressed with their ability. Now, thinking that there may might be some participants who are interested in soybean production, I had a chance to work with organic soybean production producers in Minnesota, which is just like an hour and a half southeast of here. Um, and I was really struck by the harrows that they were using. They were very stiff. They were really, really ripping the weeds out of the soil. And a lot of them had been made by the farmers. And so um, uh, it, uh, you know, so there's, there's many ways of achieving this, right? Um, and, uh, and then uh, along comes this machine, which sort of I'd been dreaming about for a long time because I've, you know, we've used these harrows a lot and, and they, you know, they don't always get all the words and maybe the, you know, we're just using an older model. And then Einbeck came up with this, they call it a rotation harrow. And it's a ground driven machine. It, 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 there's no chains driving it. It's not like a rod weeder, but just the movement of the machine allows these wheels to turn. And here's Catherine Stanley uh, working our dry beans. And what we noticed, and we've published this paper, which you can access, is pulses are extremely tolerant of this machine, including dry beans. And so uh, I, I like this machine. I'm going to show you a similar machine later. Uh, well, here it is. <laughs> and this is a Phoenix Harrow, which many of you will be familiar with. Uh, one thing that a Phoenix Harrow does is it clears trash, more or less. This one doesn't. Um, and that's its disadvantage. But another, um, you know, post-emergence uh, uh, tool for weed control that I know some organic farmers have used in, in desperate situations is a Phoenix Harrow. Um, the picture on the right here, and this is, by the way, I think Rightway uh, makes a Phoenix Harrow. Uh, this picture has got a Gandhi applicator. And I think for dryland agriculture, this is kind of interesting because it is a way of seeding cover crops without uh, reducing your ground cover. One of the other things the Minnesota farmers were doing was flaming. And I think that, you know, if we think about it for five minutes, we'll realize that all this interrow cultivation is a great idea uh, if you like interrow cultivation, uh, but not if the soil is wet because the cultivators don't work. And so the Minnesota farmers had figured this out and they're doing flaming, on row flaming. Um, which, you know, is, is about, um, you know, six to $9 an acre. So um, that's a, an, an option for these row crops. Okay, a little later in the season now, uh, we're into inter-row cultivation. And this picture here, uh, I like to show it because um, the Europeans were using inter-row cultivator, cultivators on narrow row crops, on six inch row spacing crops, for over a hundred years already. And my dad used to operate one of these behind some horses back in the old country. Um, of course, things have gotten more sophisticated now. We have camera guidance, we have, uh, we have GPS tractor guidance, and that really has opened up a lot of opportunities. Sorry. So I'm showing you two things here. Uh, we'll get to the narrow row in a minute. In fact, I'll I'll just show you. There's um there's a Garford working in narrow rows, and um, you know you can see the cameras here picking up the rows. And um, if anybody is new to this <clears throat> and saying why don't you just use the tractor GPS for this? Well, the tractor GPS is not good enough to actually get between these rows. Um, so here is somebody uh, cultivating dry beans in Manitoba with a Garford. And uh, this is quite interesting that we can now cultivate narrow road production. Not for everybody, but it's an option. So back to this picture. The other uh, feature of the camera guidance in wide road production is it allows things like these finger weeders 
to get right into the rows. Without the camera, it's difficult to really have confidence that you're you're getting these rubber finger rollers into the row without actually ripping the plants out. And here's an organic dry bean uh, cultivation in Manitoba. Um, and again, you know, the, the finger weeders get right in between the plants and do a, a, a pretty good job. Not a perfect job, but often good enough. I'm going to talk about soil health next week. And I just want to say that one of the things that I'm going to be showing you is how this scuffling or shallow tillage uh, really is not damaging to the mycorrhizal fungi at all. Okay, so we'll come back to that. Okay, so inter-row cultivation. And then when we're inter-row cultivating things like wide row corn, uh, that's a great opportunity to throw in a cover crop and uh, so that is something that is done. Um, and here on the right, we have my colleague, Dr. Yvonne Lolly's work with corn and then Harry Vetch um, seeded uh, relay cropped into the corn. Tillage has limits. Now, what do I mean by that? Do I'm talking about soil health? We're going to talk about that next week. But I think even in terms of weeds, tillage has limits. And there's two weeds in particular that I think about when I reflect on this statement. The first is wild oats. That wild oat crop in the top picture looks pretty good eh, as a wild oat crop. Uh, that's where we were growing organic dry beans and where we had used a rotative harrow and we had intero cultivated with our Garford. And there's beans there, but there's also a lot of wild oats. We were not successful in controlling them. And the other weed I think about is Canada thistle. And yes, it is possible to control this with tillage every 21 days with a wide blade cultivator or something. We know we'll uh, cut off the tops and it's not going to get rid of the deeper root system, but it um, it depletes it quite a bit. So it can uh, be controlled. This, by the way, is dandelion on the right. And maybe the third weed is, uh, many of you have already guessed it, is, um, okay, what's the weed I'm thinking about? Uh, it's that really bad one. It'll come to me. It's a perennial. Mm. Uh, anyways, if... Um, if these weeds get too bad, one really good option is just to grow an alfalfa hay crop. Alfalfa depletes the wild oat seed bank and it depletes thistle root reserves. We have good data on that. I'm not going to show it to you here, but uh, a three-year alfalfa stand cut for hay will do massive damage to both of these weed species. And field bindweed is the third weed I was thinking about. And I will say right now that the expert on field bindweed is Pat Carr in Minnesota, in Montana. Uh, I really am not qualified to talk very much about that weed. But I do know it exists in Quebec. It exists in dryland areas. <clears throat> okay, so this isn't tillage, but other weed control options is, you know, clipping above the crop. This is uh, something that we done with swathers, with specialized equipment built uh, somewhere in Saskatchewan. And then here is data on uh, what happened when they clipped the wild mustard above uh, uh, a, a grain crop and looked at the weeds the following year. So this is Brenda Frick's work out of Saskatchewan. And you can see the clipped plots have fewer wild mustard plants the next year. So it may not affect the yield that year, but it's part of an integrated weed management plan. And then of course, we have the comb cut, which is a brand new idea. And um, here is one working at Carmen. And if you're not familiar with it, its knives do not move like a sickle, like a swather. Uh, it has stationary little X-Acto knives that you can spend two days changing. Um, but it can be quite effective. Um, uh, here is where we used it at Carmen on a pretty severe thistle patch. And here is where we let the thistles grow. There's a 30% yield difference there. Um, the uh, 
The comb cut has some disadvantages. I think one of it is it's narrow. So you're driving over a lot of the crop. And that's one of the complaints that I hear from farmers. But uh, I'm pretty, uh, the data that I've seen and that we've generated uh, is, imp to me, is, is, is impressive. Um, I think uh, many farmers that I know have used it, use it too late in the season. The cereals are far along. And if you use it when the cereals are small like this, you'll get the thistles. The, the principle is the cereal leaves will slide through these knives, but broad-leafed weeds like, or hollow stem weeds like thistle and mustard and redroot pigweed, a lot of them will get cut off, okay? And uh, and if you use it early in the season, the tractor track damage is not nearly as bad and, and maybe we'll get wider machines. And then it's my observation uh, in our research that, I mean, the, cutting off the thistle doesn't eliminate it but it just sort of sits there for the rest of the year if you have a competitive cereal crop. So the comb cut is something that uh, is uh, showing to have some potential. And the final example, now this is not tillage, but this question came up last time about chaff collection. And I think one of the participants was collecting chaff successfully. Uh, and the answer is, you know, we've experienced exactly the same thing. Chaff collection is a good way to get weed seeds off the field. And uh, my former PhD student, Steve Shirtliff, did this work uh, years ago where we created uh, a wild oat patch. And then we drove a combine through it and checked out how far the combine moved those wild oats across the field. And you can see at 100 meters, uh, there's still, you know, 15 wild oat seeds per meter squared being being chucked out the back of the combine, where we collected the chaff. Uh, we um, we uh, you know had about one wild oat seed per meter squared uh, at 100 meters from the edge of the patch. The patch was right here. So, you know, this is part of an integrated weed management system. All right, now I um, promised that I would talk a bit about some conservation tillage and I saved the best till last. And I really do think this is exciting. So I'm gonna go for one last stretch here um, and take a deep breath and then get right into it. Okay, I've picked three places here on our continent um, uh, as examples. The first one comes out of Quebec. And this is, uh, thank you, Matthew, for these slides. Uh, these, uh, this is a, about an 1800 acre organic farm, been organic farming for over 20 years. Uh, this is, these are the farmers who developed that machine for red clover control. And so let's start in year one. And here they are seeding peas uh, after uh, in late summer. So this could have been a winter wheat crop that was harvested. It could have been another summer crop. And uh, the corn is not ready to harvest yet. You can see there and uh, they're planting uh, peas as a, as a cover crop. But they don't just leave the field. After planting, they make ridges. Okay, so they use this machine to make these ridges, and then the peas emerge out of that. You can see the ridges here. The next spring, the corn is seeded onto the top of the ridges. So there's a little shoe which just pushes a little bit of soil away. So you remove any weed seeds and you remove some dry soil. If you're in a spring drought, you've got nice moisture to push the, uh, to push the seeds into. And I, I used to work on sugar beets in Southern Alberta. And before, uh, you know, we, used to, we, we did work with ridging uh, and I had a chance to work with Peter Bergen on that to topic. So I, I know that ridging can actually be quite effective. And so what they do is in the corn crop, they reform the ridges later in the season. And then the following year, they plant soybeans on top of the corn ridges. So the, um, the system, this is what I would call a, a conservation agriculture system. It's got a lot of benefits in terms of weed management, soil water, making soil water available to crops and minimizing uh, intensive tillage. The second example comes from really the, the, you know, the upper 
Midwest, I guess Americans would call it, or the Eastern prairies, uh, where we're, you know, not really into the dry land, um, but the season is short. So the picture below comes from Italy. Here, they're uh, blade rolling um, hairy vetch and then direct seeding corn into that um, system. In the short season area that we're in here in Manitoba and in you know northern Minnesota and um, northern North Dakota, um, that Italian system doesn't always work well. And so what we've done is develop this rotation, organic rotational no-till system where we grow a green manure of hairy vetch with a cereal, blade roll it. Um, it goes into the winter looking like this, it winter kills. And here we're using our no-till offset disc drill. We're seeding right into the mulch and there is a beautiful uh, direct seeded organic wheat crop. Uh, so this, unlike the Italian example, this requires a whole year of green manuring, which we talked about yesterday. And then what we did, um, Carolyn Ald did her uh, PhD on this subject and um, Keith Bamford is, is my former technician who really did a lot of pioneering in making this work. So what we did is we asked ourselves, how long can we do no-till in organic? And so we set up an experiment. Um, on the left, uh, you can see where we tilled. Uh, we've I've got our organic flax coming out of our, uh, our uh, tilled land. And for that, we used a Borgo air seeder. And that's why the rows look a bit different. On the right, we have our organic no-till system where we zero tilled using our offset no-till disc drill into the mulch of hairy vetch barley. And um, we, uh, we grew flax in the first year and you can see the yields were pretty comparable, the no-till a little bit lower. And the following year we grew oats and the yields were very comparable. And so, um, what we found is that we could actually avoid tillage for two consecutive years using this system. And the secret really was to have enough mulch to suppress the weeds. Um, so, you know, that that's the system that we used. And then again, going to Minnesota, um, I learned a, a, a different system, this one for soybeans. Now you've all heard of the Rodale system where they've got the Rodale crimper and then they follow it up with soybeans. But in the short season region, the problem is once our rye flowers and we can crimp it and kill it, it's too late to seed the soybeans. So what these Minnesota farmers were doing is they were growing the rye, then they zero tilled in the uh, soybeans into the standing rye using a John Deere Maximerge seeder. And then when the rye flowered, they flail mowed it. And this is what they got. So what I decided to do is to try this, what I call the Fergus, Minnesota system in Carmen. So we grew the fall rye and we zero tilled in the soybeans. Uh, the soybeans emerged in the fall rye pretty well. And then we flail mowed the rye once the rye flowered. And how did we do? Well, you know, acceptable, I would say. There on the left is... On the left here is where the beans were seeded into the growing rye and we flail mowed the rye at flowering. And on the right is where we tilled the rye in the spring before bean seeding. So this is more of a standard practice. And yes, it yielded more. We had less competition from the rye. Um, and But this allowed us to use a no-till approach for one year. And in some cases that might be really useful. With so robust, tough plant, we tried it with dry beans, didn't work. Here, now the treatments are flipped. On the right is where we direct seeded into the rye and flail mowed it. There were hardly any beans. So dry beans just aren't aggressive enough for this system. Now the, the Fergus, Minnesota system, well, actually the Rodale system was used uh, on a farm that we have the pleasure of cooperating with in uh, near uh, Kitchener, Ontario. And there, uh, Brent, Brett Israel grew the fall rye, and in this area delineated by red, he seeded the soybeans into the rye and then used a blade roller, just crimped it, just crimped the blade, the, the stuff, and got a really nice uh, soybean crop. 
Um, and around here, this is where they till they they tilled the rye, and still a very good soybean crop, but it's weedy. But the um, the Israel's farm at Three Gen Organics, uh, they've been using a different system. And this, I wanted to share this because this is the kind of innovation that happens when farmers get involved and it's not just held on the research station. So what they did is planted the fall rye, and you know, as we would, uh, as we would, and instead of crimping it, they actually took it for hay, um, used a high speed disc, uh, and then planted a organic soybean crop using narrow rows, using plant competition to crowd out the weeds. And in Ontario, traditional soybean production is wide row. And this year they harvested 72 bushels of organic soybeans here. And uh, according to Brett, uh, who we've worked with now for a number of years. So um, this is still a soil conserving system uh, and they happen to have access to livestock manure. So, um, uh, you know, they, they're bringing carbon into the system all kinds of ways. And the final example, um, and this is probably the one for for which I have the the least you know impressive knowledge, uh, even though I did a lot of work in Saskatchewan in my earlier years, um, is the dryland area. So here we have an early version of a blade cultivator that cuts underneath the surface um, and kills weeds and leaves crop residue on the surface. And of course now we use what we call a noble blade. And thank you to um, the crab trees for allowing me to pilfer uh, images from your website. Uh, and so they're using the wide blade cultivator to control um, uh, green manures. And it is a nice soil conserving practice. Here's an, an old picture of a cat caterpillar pulling, uh, uh, you know, wide blade cultivators. And so there are tools available to do conservation in very dry land areas as well, of course. And I've been so impressed with the wide blade cultivator that we've actually started using it in our long-term plots at Glen Lee here, just south of Winnipeg in the Red River Valley. Now we don't have a lot of rocks, so this works pretty well. Um, and, uh, and here you can see these are organic crops that have been cultivated with this. We have a single wide blade. Now there's, other uh, important options for controlling, uh, for, for, for managing, for con having, you know, soil conservation systems in dr very dry land areas. One of it is perennial grass strips, uh, which here is on Villicus Farms. Uh, and, and um, you know, there's, there's these types of options. There's also uh, tillage equipment that is very good at keeping residue from being buried. And so uh, the Phoenix Harrow is just another example of that. And then I, I also, um, you know, we, we don't have a lot of droughts uh, here where we are, but, but we do have some. And 2021 was a really good drought for us uh, here. It was, it was unbelievable. And it really showed the value of using the spring snow melt to get all your crops started. And um, this is the picture of our organic oats, which was under seeded we seeded sweet clover at the same time. Uh, I think there is a lot of value to a farming system where you try to get your crops established when you have the greatest opportunity to have moisture. So that is my um, lecture this morning, but I am not done because I want to spend the last five minutes answering one of the questions that came up last class. Okay, um, so, and this is what we'll be, I'll try to do a little bit of this every day, but we'll spend Friday doing this. So, okay, somebody asked, how can one avoid disease in pulse crops with pulses in rotation on short intervals? How long should the interval between pulse crops or green manures be? All right, so um, what, uh, where my mind went is, of phenomyces in peas, also called root rot. This is a serious challenge for peas. Um, and the uh, rotations I showed you last class, um, you'll remember there were some farmers who grew peas quite a bit in their rotation. So is that a problem? Well, 
Um, there's uh, quite a bit of expertise in Canada uh, on this um, on this topic. One is uh, Siama Chatterton at Ag Canada Lethbridge, and here she uh, wrote a paper with some colleagues on rethinking pulse crop production in the era of Aphenomyces root rot. And here she's showing a picture of um, uh, uh, a, a pea crop uh, in a four-year rotation and a pea crop in a an eight-year rotation. And this one is much healthier than this one. And if we look at the recommendations for how often you should grow peas, the old German textbooks say once every six years. In Canada, the recommendation is no more than every four years. And then uh, the Manitoba Pulse and Soybean Growers say that fields diagnosed with aphenomyces should be cropped to peas only once every seven to eight years. Okay, that's not completely answering the question. Uh, the second uh, part of the um, uh, answer is to rotate peas with non and, and lentils, which are also susceptible with non host legume species. So for example, uh, the Lethbridge group has told us that peas, lentils, sicer milk vetch, they're susceptible to root rot. Uh, chickpea, sainfoin, faba bean, soybean, fenugreek are not, or there are at least varieties that are resistant. So if we grew, you know, soybean and peas in the same, in a six year rotation where peas only appeared once, uh, that would seem very reasonable. One of the big questions is alfalfa. Is alfalfa susceptible? And uh, the answer is yes, uh, but there, the susceptibility may not be that intense and there's some varieties that are more resistant than others. Now, this is uh, data from Ag Canada Lethbridge in 2020, and they're comparing it to some older data in 1991. And here's all the crop species that you can look at. Um, and, uh, and it shows that, you know, bursine clover is resistant, white Dutch clover is resistant, uh, lupins are resistant, uh, uh, red clover is resistant, subterranean clover is resistant. Um, alfalfa was shown, lucerne here was shown to be susceptible by the 1991 group, but it wasn't tested by the Lethbridge group, or at least they're not showing it here. So the, I, I think really the story here is if you're looking at including, let's say you have a six-year rotation and you have a six-year rotation and you want to grow, you know, three different legumes, you know, make sure that only one of them is susceptible to aphenomyces. Uh, the story is not done yet. Um, here's some research from France where they grow a lot of peas. So they have a lot of experience with the phenomyces. And um, they said here that um, there are resistant varieties of vetch and faba bean and then lupin clover uh, and alfalfa they found to be uh, pretty resistant. Uh, maybe they're dealing with certain varieties. And then... Um, the uh, third part of my answer would be to think about what are the other crops in the rotation doing to the disease, the aphenomyces, and brassicas are known to suppress aphenomyces. So we'll talk about that on Tuesday because we're going to talk about, about pest management. So you can read some of that. And uh, the Lethbridge group is also recommending this. And I've got some data here. Um, I've got the reference down here. And you can see that in these soils, uh, aphenomyces was very low after, you know, oats, after sweet clover, after, you know, rapeseed. Uh, and, you know, the crops that were driving the aphenomyces were peas and alfalfa. And so this is, um, uh, uh, so, so uh, another part of the answer is that uh, wet soils and soil compaction and poor soil health and low uh, arbuscular mycorrhiza, they're all going to contribute to root rots. And then finally, uh, when you are growing um, uh, legumes in a green manure situation, it's different than when green manures are grown for grain. Because uh, let's say here, for example, you've got a peel mixture, got 4010 forage peas here with oats, although I can't see the oats, but they're in there. 
and you, you terminate it at full flower, the, ex, the potential for that crop to be infected by the disease is much lower. So that's my response. And now I am officially out of time and I'm gonna stop sharing and turn it back to our hosts. Wherever they are. Where I'm here, Martin. <laughs> that was awesome. So thank you so much for that, Martin. And uh, just a quick thank you to our sponsors again and to Marla and her colleagues in the background for making this happen. And I'm just going to show you the final slide. And just hold your phone up to that. Oops. and take a picture. And I will send out the official sign-up sheet if you're finding this difficult to use. And uh, we hope that the slides will be up on the Pivot and Grow website just as quickly as they were yesterday. And we are back again next Tuesday to talk about uh, pests and disease. So if you haven't had a chance to look at the notes, uh, you can study up over the weekend. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you for attending.